Bom dia, pessoal. Esse é o nosso primeiro vídeo sobre o nosso curso de Eletrônica 1. Sempre que possível, eu vou procurar postar alguns vídeos para que os alunos possam acompanhar em casa quando não entenderam a aula direito. Sejam, então, bem-vindos ao nosso curso de Eletrônica. Aqui nós temos um resumo do programa do curso. No início, nós vamos estudar um componente muito importante, o diodo. Né? Vamos falar sobre os fundamentos sobre diodos e sobre as aplicações do diodo. Em seguida, é, nós vamos falar sobre transistores MOS e bipolares. É, nesses, nessa sequência de vídeo em particular, nós vamos ver primeiro os transistores bipolares e, em seguida, os transistores MOS. Tá? Vamos aprender fundamentos, polarização, modelos de grandes sinais e de pequenos sinais. Então, vamos aprender tudo sobre é, esses dois componentes muito importantes, os transistores bipolares e os transistores MOS. E no final, vamos falar sobre um outro componente, que na verdade é o que é mais usado hoje na prática para circuitos analógicos, que são os amplificadores operacionais. Vamos aprender a teoria, os circuitos básicos e as funções lineares e não lineares que esses circuitos permitem implementar. O livro que nós vamos usar como texto é esse aqui, Fundamentos de Microeletrônica de Berzad Hazav. Existe a versão em papel e também uma versão para o Kindle, que permite que você leia em formato eletrônico. Procure adquirir o seu o quanto antes. Antes de começar, eu queria comentar alguns aspectos da matéria e falar sobre algumas dicas para vocês conseguirem ter um estudo mais efetivo. Essa matéria é bastante complexa, tá? não é impossível, mas é difícil, e exige muitos estudos e muitos exercícios, tá? e usa uma linguagem complexa, e você tem que dominar essa linguagem e os métodos utilizados. É importante que você conheça bem a teoria de circuitos e consiga analisar os circuitos, né? é, circuitos básicos, e aplicar essa análise para os circuitos eletrônicos que nós vamos ver aqui. Toda vez que você fizer um exercício e tiver alguma parte da teoria dos circuitos que você está com dificuldade, é importante que você repasse até que você sane todas as dúvidas sobre essa técnica. Então, é essencial muito esforço e uma dedicação sistemática ao estudo e aos exercícios. No início do curso, é, eu coloquei uma música do famoso compositor João Sebastião, que ele é um exemplo de, é, de pessoa que adquiriu grande proficiência no que fazia. Ele é talvez o maior, ou no mínimo um dos maiores compositores de todos os tempos, porque ele se dedicava muito a dominar a língua da música. Né? Vocês viram lá a partitura... Né, e, e estudou um monte de coisas de forma muito sistemática, todo dia. Tá? E para você se tornar realmente um mestre em, em, na arte da eletrônica, é essencial que você faça isso. Ou seja, não tem um atalho, não tem um segredo. Realmente o segredo é muita dedicação. Mas tem formas melhores de você se dedicar. E vamos falar aqui algumas dicas né, sobre o que a gente entende como formas efetivas de estudar. Em particular, eu vou apresentar aqui um vídeo é, sobre o conceito de Deep Work. Vai ser um vídeo, inclusive, da pessoa que cunhou é, esse termo. Tá? Que eu acho que vai ser bastante interessante é, para vocês. Eu vou tocar o vídeo para vocês e peço que vocês assistam com bastante atenção. I recently read the book Deep Work by author Cal Newport. 
Kel defines deep work as professional activities performed in a state of distraction-free concentration that pushes your cognitive abilities to their limit. These efforts create new value, improve your skill, and are hard to replicate. J.K. Rowling used deep work to complete the final book of her Harry Potter series, The Deadly Hollows, in 2007. She needed to escape the distraction of screaming kids and barking dogs, so she checked into a suite in a five-star hotel in downtown Edinburgh, Scotland. She says, I didn't intend to stay there, but the first day's writing went well, so I kept coming back, and I ended up finishing the last of the Harry Potter books here. Bill Gates used deep work in 1974 to program the first version of BASIC in just eight weeks. Cal says that Gates worked with such intensity for such lengths during the two-month stretch that he would often collapse into sleep on his keyboard in the middle of writing a line of code. He would then sleep for an hour or two, wake up, and pick up right where he left off. The BASIC software that Gates wrote in eight weeks while in a state of deep work became the foundation of a billion-dollar company. Author Cal Newport, an MIT graduate and Georgetown professor, claims that deep work allowed him to double his output of research papers while raising a family, writing this book, and teaching full-time at a prestigious university. The first two cases, Gates and J.K. Rowling, might be extreme, as most people don't have the ability to go off the grid and do deep work for weeks at a time. But Cal shows that we can maintain a busy schedule and still find ways to do deep work and produce significant results in our lives that others find hard to replicate. But how exactly does deep work lead to these best-selling books, innovative products, and elite levels of productivity? Well, neuroscientists have found that intense periods of focus in isolated fields of work causes myelin to develop in relevant areas of the brain. Myelin is a white tissue that develops around neurons and allows brain cells to fire faster and cleaner. So in a sense, when we practice deep work, we upgrade our brains and allow specific brain circuits to fire more effortlessly and effectively. The brain upgrade we get from deep work allows you to rapidly connect ideas and uncover creative solutions. In today's economy, the ability to do deep work is increasingly valuable and increasingly rare. It's valuable because when you produce something great in our hyper-connected world, it has the ability to spread to billions of people. Producing something great is necessary to stand out amongst the noise and avoid being forgotten by the flood of information that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Think of your last tweet. How long did it last? How quickly was it forgotten? Deep work is becoming increasingly rare because deep work requires undivided attention and our world is being filled with more and more tempting distractions. So the ability to do deep work is becoming increasingly difficult Coworkers expect you to immediately respond to an email or an instant message. Employers want you to function in an open office concept of constant distraction. Your friends and followers online expect you to maintain a social media presence. It's not enough to try to ignore these distractions. We are hardwired to be distracted and pay attention to novelty. In a 2012 study led by psychologists Wilhelm Hoffman and Roy Baumeister involving 205 adults, found that we are only able to resist temptations to take a break from work, to check email, surf the web, or watch TV just 50% of the time. But there is hope. You can build a skill of deep work and escape the trap of constant distraction, thus separating you from the pack and making you indispensable in today's economy. Here are three deep work strategies that you can incorporate into your schedule to heighten your ability to focus and produce results that are hard to replicate. First, Schedule your distraction periods at home and at work. Most of us allow ourselves to go online at any moment and check our phone whenever it buzzes or dings, but doing so is training your brain to avoid deep work. A day full of unscheduled distraction is training your brain to give in to any and all distractions. To build your tolerance to avoid distraction, you need to place boundaries on your distraction. Have a notepad nearby and put down the next distraction break you'll have. Hold your focus until that time. At first, it's going to be painful, but remember that doing this is effectively doing the reps that build your ability to concentrate. Second, develop a rhythmic deep work ritual. Cal says the easiest way to consistently start deep work sessions is to transform them into a simple, regular habit. The goal, in other words, is to generate a rhythm for this work that removes the need for you to invest energy in deciding if and when you're going to go deep. 
Callie uses several examples in the book to show that scheduling chunks of deep focus in an ad hoc manner doesn't yield much productivity at all. For people who are not seasoned at doing deep work, it's best for them to have a reoccurring time each day or each week to go into deep work. Early morning is typically the best time to do this, because at that time, you typically don't have to deal with incoming requests. The research shows that people new to deep work can typically only do it for about one hour, and masters of deep work can typically only hold their attention up to four hours, in intervals between 60 and 90 minutes throughout the day. So the ultimate goal of each day is to plant deep work rituals throughout the day with the ultimate goal of building up the sum of your deep work practices to four hours a day. The third strategy to cultivate deep work in your life is to have a daily shutdown complete ritual. Sleep is the price we need to pay in order to do deep work. It's the interest we pay on the loans of intense focus required to do deep work. To ensure that we get adequate sleep and restore our attentional reserves for the following day, Cal recommends that we incorporate an evening shutdown into our daily routine. An evening shutdown ritual involves making a plan to complete any unfinished tasks, goals, or projects the following day. Getting a series of steps lined out for the following day is enough to get items off your mind so you can disconnect for the rest of the day. When you get things off your mind, you restore the ability to sleep well and do deep work the following day. After Cal completes his plan for the following day, he will say to himself, shut down complete. It's pretty cheesy, but he says it's a great cue to unplug. In the end, deep work is incredibly valuable because it changes your brain and allows you to produce innovative work that is hard to replicate. That was the core message that I gathered from Cal's great book. Cal does a great job of teaching deep work rituals and reducing the fear of leaving shallow work behind. I highly recommend this book for anyone looking to make something meaningful in this world. If you would like a one-page PDF summary that includes the steps needed to build a deep work ritual, just click the link below and I'd be happy to email it to you. If you already subscribe to the free Productivity Game newsletter, this PDF is already in your inbox. Thanks for watching. Então, pessoal, eu considero essa técnica muito valiosa e muito efetiva. Todos os estudantes que usaram essa técnica, que eu conheço, melhoraram bastante o rendimento. Tá? Então, eu acho excelente se vocês comprarem o livro, lerem, ou então assistirem mais vídeos, ou até mesmo tentar fazer o que está explicado aqui. Vocês vão se surpreender como o rendimento de vocês vai melhorar. Foco é uma coisa muito importante. Pessoal, agora que nós já falamos sobre algo muito importante, que é o foco, vamos falar sobre algumas coisas um pouco mais específicas, que são uh, estratégias mais efetivas de estudo. Eu queria passar para vocês um, alguns vídeos muito interessantes tirados do curso do site EDX, que é um site de cursos gratuitos. Tá? É, é, o, é, o, é o curso é, The Science of Everyday Thinking, né? a ciência do pensamento de todo dia. Tá? Tem um capítulo nesse curso que fala sobre como estudar, é, mais precisamente sobre quais são as técnicas mais efetivas de fato para estudar. Então, é, a minha opção vai ser passar para vocês os vídeos e peço que vocês assistam com muito cuidado, porque eu acredito que vocês vão ter muito a ganhar com elas. Vamos lá então? Pessoal, eu vou passar para vocês agora uns vídeos de um curso de um site chamado EDX, tá? www.edidadox.org. É, esse site apresenta vários cursos gratuitos e de excelente qualidade. O vídeo que nós vamos ver aqui é o capítulo 5 desse curso aqui, desse site. The Science of... Everyday Thinking, é a ciência do pensamento no dia a dia. Esse capítulo, 
O capítulo 5 é muito bom e vai ser muito útil para vocês. É, eu gostaria de ressaltar também que todo o curso é interessante, com um monte de assuntos realmente interessantes e muito excitantes. É, então eu, eu encorajo todos a assistirem o curso inteiro. Mas para cá, vamos nos concentrar nesse vídeo. Mas aqui vamos nos concentrar nesses vídeos específicos sobre como aprender melhor. Vamos agora assistir esse capítulo 5. Esse é um curso de uma famosa universidade australiana e eu vou mostrar aqui para vocês como acessar o curso na internet. O que, que vocês vão fazer? Vocês vão entrar no navegador e digitar o site é, é www edx.org ok? então vocês vão digitar esse, esses, esses dados aqui tá? então vamos lá entramos então no navegador né? tá? e aqui nós vamos www.edx.org entramos então na página do edx que tem vários cursos e vamos procurar por The Science of Everyday Thinking. Ok? Então, é... aí vamos procurar o curso. Então, ele está aqui. É um curso da Universidade de Queensland, na Austrália. Tá? Aqui você pode ver um vídeo, né? É, tá sem som aqui, né? Mas você pode ver um, um vídeo que é uma demonstração do, é, do curso, né? Fala um pouco é, de forma geral sobre o curso. E aí você vai entrar aqui e se matricular, tá? Então você clica aqui, tá? E é, faz, faz a, a, segue as instruções para fazer a matrícula, tá? É, é interessante que você pode ou fazer gratuito, né? Você vai ser um estudante ouvinte. Ou você pode também é, fazer o curso por, pelo valor de 50 dólares. E nesse caso você vai ter um diploma do curso. Tá? É, vamos lá. Eu já me matriculei aqui. Então eu vou entrar aqui. Né? É, eu vou me, é, me registrar aqui. Tá? E aqui já estão tá os meus dados, minha senha, né? E vou lá e já vou acessar o curso. Né? Vocês vão, é claro. É... Então tá aqui. Uh, the Science of Everyday Thinking. Aí você vem né? é... e vai assistir o curso. É... é um curso muito interessante, com muita coisa interessante. Esse capítulo 2, excepcional, né? mostra para você como a mente funciona, como ela tem algumas eficiências e deficiências, né, que você tem, né, é, é, você, por exemplo, aquela história de falsa memória, é verdade, existe, né, é, como a mente sempre procura dar algum sentido às coisas, mesmo que, os, mesmo que o sentido não exista, né, ele fala aqui sobre aqueles fenômenos, né, que às vezes o pessoal fala que se você tocar o disco dos Beatles ou da Xuxa, ao contrário, você vai ouvir uma frase, né, e aí você fala a frase e de repente você de fato começa a ouvir aquela frase, tá, mas ela na verdade não existe, né? o seu cérebro coloca aquela frase lá de algum jeito. Então, realmente sensacional esse capítulo e todo mundo vai gostar. Mas aqui nós vamos ver, na verdade, o capítulo 5, né? Aprendendo a Aprender. Tá? Eu sugiro, inclusive, que vocês façam por aqui, né? Vocês nem precisam seguir pelo vídeo agora, né? Podem ver aqui porque tem alguns exercícios, tem algumas avaliações, ok? Então é isso. Vamos, então, nos concentrar nesse capítulo 5. Mas, repetindo, é, esse é um curso que realmente vale a pena fazer, na minha opinião. Ok? Vamos em frente, então.
Over the last few episodes, we saw that our intuitions about how we perceive and remember the world are often mistaken. And in fact, we have no real privileged access into the basis of our decisions, how it is that we do what we do. In the last episode, we introduced a more realistic account of how the mind works. We spoke about System 1 and System 2 and chatted to Danny Kahneman about some of the heuristics and biases that we rely on, uh, that we have to rely on, in order to deal with the complexity and ambiguity of the world. One of the things I, I think is important that um, people take away from the last episode is that it's not really a matter of just slowing down. That's not really a solution. And as Danny Kahneman said during our interview, when we asked him how to improve everyday thinking, he suggested that we pick only a couple of areas uh, and try to improve those or recruit the help of a friend, someone who's looking at uh, the circumstance from the outside. And the reason he made this suggestion, I think, is that uh, you know, he's been doing this a long time, 50 years I think he's been in, in, in this area, and he's won a Nobel Prize. If anyone is going to improve their everyday thinking by, you know, generally improving their uh, problem-solving skills, it's going to be Danny Kahneman. And he mentioned that his everyday thinking hasn't improved over the last thir uh, 50 years or so. And so, where does that leave us? Well, um, just being more careful or being more deliberate really isn't going to help necessarily. Uh, so that's only half the story. Of course, learning uh, the names of these heuristics and biases are important so people can recognize them when they're actually happening. But there's, that's only half the story. The other half of the story is what we're going to talk about today, which is learning to learn. And we talked to Jeff Norman, uh, who essentially teaches this stuff to doctors, uh, about, this, about this very topic. And here's what he had to say. So how do they improve? As, as an expert, um, you mentioned that we, uh, going slow doesn't necessarily help, um, being deliberative, um, and there's this uh, compounded issue of, of self-assessment that we often don't know how good we're actually doing in any given case. I mean, what does that mean for improving practice? How do we get better? How do we, um, the, the goal of this course that we're taking is called the science of everyday thinking. Uh, so given your experience, um, in, in the field of expertise and in medicine, how do we improve everyday thinking? You improve by knowing more. <laughs> <laughs> so just the accumulation of experiences. Yeah, it seems so tantalizing. It would be really nice if I could be very prescriptive and say, well, if you do this, that, and the other thing, then you'll be much better. At some level, I guess there's got to be a bit of a germ of truth in that. I mean, this course wouldn't exist if we didn't think that there's some that being explicit about everyday thinking and the, the, the traps in everyday thinking wouldn't help people think better. And, and at some level that's true, but that's generally locking into what's been called general problem solving strategies, which are not very powerful. Sure, that's going to help a bit. Um, I suppose reflection is going to help a little bit. But it seems that all of these strategies, to sort of generalize hor horrendously, are good for about a 10% improvement. Uh, it's not zero, but it's not night and day or black and white either. And very clearly, the single best predictor of how good you are is how much you know about the domain, not what problem-solving skills you bring to bear on it. We began there. That was wrong. The question is, are there strategies we can do to optimize the acquisition of knowledge? And again, we're talking about two kinds of knowledge, formal knowledge and experiential knowledge. And we're now beginning to discover, and I can't take any personal credit for this one. This isn't my domain. But people like Mayer, Bjork, Rodiger, have been working hard on taking models of the nature of, of the mind, short-term working memory, long-term memory associative, and turning that into very prescriptive and powerful strategies to enhance the efficiency of learning. Uh, things like, an obvious thing like mixing up the, the examples from across multiple chapters so that you have to try and figure out which is which. It turns out to be an extremely powerful strategy for learning. The idea of transfer, which is being able to take knowledge that you've learned in one context and apply it to another. One, it doesn't happen at all as easily as we think it does. But two, psychologists have devised strategies to make that happen better. So I think this is moving much more into the instructional, educational psychology end of things. There are things we can do to very much enhance the efficiency with which you acquire the knowledge you need to get the job done as a, as a diagnostician or as a human. My name is Jeff. I think about reasoning. 
I think it's really clear now that just telling people to slow down, to be more careful, is not going to help people improve their everyday thinking. Uh, yeah, it's really important that we have the vocabulary for this stuff. You need to be able to, to know what the heuristics and biases are and point to them and see where they're operating. Uh, but as Jeff said, the key to improving thinking, to thinking better, is to know more. So if you want to be a better singer, you have to spend time singing. If you want to become a better cricket player, you have to practice. That's part of the story, I think. But the other half is, um, as Jeff said, yes, practice is important. You need to spend the, the time and the effort actually doing the thing that it is that you want to improve on. But the other is actually taking the advice or learning from experts, so reading. Right? You need to spend time looking at the things that experts say are important within that field in order to improve a lot more. So um, when it comes to sport, knowing where to put your fingers or your feet is, is critical. Right? In academics, learning from experts or academics to tell you what area or what, what things to read within that area so you're not going down blind, al blind alleys all the time. They can tell you exactly what you need to, to where you need to focus your attention. And that's really important, that's what reading does. But this idea of general knowledge, or um, general problem solving, as Jeff Norman called it, is a little bit tricky, isn't it? I mean, he said that, yes, that's not gonna help. Having this sort of generic problem solving capability hasn't done very well in the past. And, and Danny Kahneman mentioned that in his, in his interview as well. So just having this sort of blunt force thing that you can apply to each of these different areas isn't going to be terribly successful. And the reason it's not is that it's so far removed, right? So you have this sort of general purpose tool that you're applying to all of these different very specific things. And by that very nature, it's going to be unsuccessful because it's so far removed from each of these different areas. But what is going to be successful is exactly as you mentioned. It's in order to improve everyday thinking, you need to know more. You need to, to expand your experiences with that particular domain. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, specifically. Learning how to learn. If your goal is to try to improve, is, try, is to try to um, know as much as you can about a particular domain, we can help. Uh, we know a lot. We can help you get there uh, more efficiently. So we can help with... Um, learning the information faster and hanging on to it for a longer period of time. And so we talked to John Donlosky, who's done an enormous amount of work in this area. Uh, he's done a, a massive analysis of all of the techniques that seem to be effective and those that don't. And here's what he had to say. You've done uh, recently an, an enormous meta-analysis, yeah. an analysis of analyses, and uh, <laughs> you've looked at a whole bunch of different types of learning techniques, yep. so things that students can use or do use um, to try to improve their learning. Right. Um, could you tell us a bit about, uh, about what you've done and, and, um, and what you found? Sure. Uh, with a large group of collaborators who actually worked very hard on this project for almost three years. We just reviewed lots of literatures, as you said, about the effectiveness of a variety of strategies. What we didn't look at were strategies that involved technology, because we wanted to focus on just those things that any student could use. And we chose those strategies for two reasons. Some of them that we wanted to evaluate, we thought they probably did work, but why not check out the evidence? Mm -hmm. A couple other strategies, however, we knew students used a lot, and we wanted to know, are these these really effective strategies, or they, should they be doing something else instead? So something that all students use, I still do it myself, is highlighter. We like to highlight things when we're reading. It's like a security blanket or something for learning. But it turns out highlighting itself doesn't really improve student learning, right? It doesn't increase achievement in any way. I would never take a highlighter away from a student. Again, it's like a security blanket. But it's just the beginning of the learning journey. It's not the end of it. Yep. So after you highlight all the important stuff, it turns out most textbooks highlight it for you anyway. Sure. You need to go back and use effective techniques to learn that material. So at least some of the things that students do, like highlighting and rereading, really don't have a big bang for 
the time buck, so to speak. So they'll spend time rereading, highlighting. Hmm. They're really not learning a whole lot when, in fact, they can replace those strategies with other ones that really do boost their learning, So, which is exciting. Sure. So now we just have to retrain students, build a better yeah. student, right, to use better strategies. Interesting. So highlighting, rereading doesn't have much of an effect. No, um, it doesn't. Isn't that strange? You'd think re everybody rereads, right? You go back to the material. Unfortunately, when you go back to reread, your eyes are moving across the page. Right? It's probably late at night, the night before an exam, and your mind is somewhere else. Mm -hmm. right? So basically mind-watering as I'm rereading. Students need to do things that are more uh, to engage them more actively. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. So in this analysis, mm -hmm. you, you looked at some things also that, that had a massive effect. Um, yes. What, um, obviously, I mean, it, it makes sense. I mean, a lot of people, when they, when they are studying or cramming for an exam, mm -hmm. um, these are the things we do, but they might not be the most effective. Uh, what are the most effective? What are the things that actually work? Certainly cramming is not that effective, right? Uh, students think it's effective, partly because they can squeak by potentially in the exam, and then they'll just forget everything. I'm not suggesting students don't study the night before a test. It relieves anxiety and all this sort of thing. But there are better things they can do. First, instead of just cramming, begin studying two or three weeks before an exam. Okay, so you're distributing your practice out across time which is very important. So you're studying the same material over and over again. Now that does take a little planning, maybe a calendar to remind yourself, geez, it's two weeks before the exam, now I really need to hit the books, yep. versus just the night before when you're panicking and you try to cram. So distributed practice is really good, but distributed practice just tells you kind of a schedule of how you should be studying, kind of like the when of studying. Mm -hmm. But there are lots of what's, the things you can do instead of just rereading the material passively. And one that we find is really effective, and many others, there's about 100 years of research, uh, very exciting, showing how effective this is, just retrieval practice. Mm -hmm. So after you mark up your book, right, and about all the important things, and you go back, instead of just rereading everything you marked up, cover it up with your hand, and just try to recall from memory the content. Okay? And if the student gets that answer right from memory, that has a really potent effect on subsequent performance. They really learn it that much better. Of course, if they can't recall it from memory, then they can restudy at that point, but then they should come back and keep trying. So just retrieval practice, a really effective way to boost performance, especially if students use it distributed across time. Sure. Yeah. So, so it's kind of like flashcards, I guess. Absolutely like flashcards. And you know, most students at least say uh, they use flashcards, right, for simple paired associate learning, things like uh, foreign language vocabulary. But you can use flashcards for complex materials as well, concepts. So you write the key term on one side, definition on the other side, and then use that to basically test yourself and then to restudy. Even uh, important concepts in textbooks, right? How they take notes, they can take notes in better ways to actually support uh, the use of retrieval practice, which is an effective strategy mm -hmm. that many students don't use. They yeah. underutilize it, yeah. Yeah. So retrieval practice, I, so then it's, uh, I suppose, really pretty effortful uh, by comparison to rereading right. or highlighting. Yep. So it probably takes a fair bit of um, desire on the part of the student to, to want to learn that. It, it absolutely does. I mean, it's very easy to sit there and reread, mm -hmm. right? Especially when your mind is somewhere else thinking about how fun it's going to be after you take your exam type of thing. Yep. Uh, where it does take a little bit more effort that engages you to try to retrieve the information. The nice thing is, out of all these studies that are done to compare rereading to retrieval practice, the time on task is always equated. Mm -hmm. So the students who are just rereading spend the same amount of time that the students are who are practicing retrieval. Okay. So yeah, it might be a little bit more effortful. You know, It's like a little bit more painful to try to retrieve stuff from yeah. memory. Yeah. But even the same amount of time used in one strategy versus the other, the students who are practicing retrieval using a little bit of extra effort are getting a major, uh, basically, increase in their performance. Interesting. Right, yeah. It's, huh. And so the other aspect yeah. to that, the, the distributed learning, the spaced learning, mm -hmm. um, what does that entail? I mean, so does that entail yeah. studying um, a little bit each day? Or is it, uh, how many days do you need? Is it? Um, well, that's a $100 question, yeah, or maybe right. even $10,000 question. <laughs> uh, how, I, this is how I think about it. Let's say you're a student uh, getting ready for an exam. And maybe you decide, OK, I can give this four hours of my time. Mm -hmm. Most students, because they think cramming is good, they'll spend that four hours the night before the exam. And just study, study, study. Okay. Okay. They're going to do a lot better off if they take the same four hours and just basically 
segment it into four one-hour study sessions that are spread across, say, two weeks prior to the exam. Again, the same amount of time, but now that just spread across time where you're coming back to the same material versus just kind of going over that material over and over again during one four-hour block. How much they need to do for long-term retention, uh, a whole lot, okay? Uh, this won't be a great strategy to learn all your course content. You gotta decide what's most important, what you think you're gonna be tested on, and focus on that material. Uh, but the more is the better. The more, you, uh, the more often you come back and restudy, of course, yeah. and use retrieval practice, the longer you're gonna retain that material. So for stuff that students really need to know, yeah. this is an essential strategy, else they just forget stuff. I mean, you don't have to tell a student, right, that after they take a test that they cram for, mm -hmm. the next day they pretty much don't remember anything mm -hmm. that they studied. Yeah. Distributed practice ensures that you're going to remember that for a much longer period of time. My name is John. I think about reflection. And we talk to our students a lot about this, and certainly based on my own experiences, I completely agree with John. Many of us spend uh, the night before an exam just trying to cram weeks and weeks of material into our heads. The same goes with a big presentation that you have to give in front of people. Uh, what strikes me, though, is how we can get it so wrong. I mean, we've had years and years of schooling. We've had lots of time to figure out exactly what the best strategies are to get information into our head, uh, but we use these inefficient strategies. I mean, how is it that we can get it so wrong? That's a really interesting problem, and it's one that people are actually working on. It's not done and dusted. Uh, John Dunlosky, who we talked to, has done a fair bit of work. Bob Bjork, who we're going to hear from next, is also working in that field, and, uh, and Nate Cornell. And they're trying to figure out exactly that. How do people get it so wrong? How is it that you can have a lifetime of experiences in learning. You've tried a lot of things that work and a lot of things that don't, yet we continually make these sorts of mistakes like cramming. Cramming is not effective for actually having things stick in your memory. So why do we continue to use it? And I think from reading their work, uh, there are at least a couple of reasons. One reason is that it is effective in the short term. Right? So if you have a big exam and you study as hard as you possibly can, it's probably enough to get you by. It's enough to get you over the line. You'll pass that exam and you'll see, you'll directly associate those efforts for studying the exam and that passing mark. Those two will go hand in hand and you'll see that connection. What you won't see is the, the lack of effect six months later. So if you're taking an advanced course in that topic that you've been cramming for, in six months' time, you're not going to see the fact that you don't know anything that you've studied for six months previously, right? So there's that lack of association, I think, is important. The second reason that people continually think that cramming is important, I think, is something called fluency. Now, we touched on this with respect to the availability heuristic. So people mistake the size of a category with, um, with the ease with which it goes down. And the same thing is kind of happening here. People are mistaking the, the, the fluency, the ease with which the information that they're studying is going down with learning. And they're not the same thing. And so when you're cramming, you're massing all of this information together. You're, you're repeating each of these things. And then you reread it. And you, um, it's all of this massed information feels like it's going down. It feels genuinely like you understand that material. And you're mistaking that ease of processing with learning. Yep, and it's exactly the same for rereading. So uh, you, before, when you're studying for an exam or before a presentation, you read through the material you're supposed to remember. And then, oh, I've got to do something else, so I'll read through it again. And every time you read through it, it just feels better and better. It feels like you're learning. Uh, <laughs> but obviously, that, it's, that's a mistake. It's, it, it feels good and um, it seems to be one of those things, again, that our predictions about how things actually working are, are completely uh, disjointed with reality. And that's exactly right. And I think that's what we're going to work on, particularly in this episode, is, is a little bit more myth-busting, because this one is hard. This one isn't easy, because what we think works for learning is almost, it's not even that 
that there's no relationship between what we think and, and reality, but in fact it's a negative relationship. What we think works is the exact opposite of what actually works. And so we talked to Bob Bjork about this, and he's, <laughs> he's been working in this field longer than anyone I know, and, uh, and he had some pretty good advice about, about what works and what doesn't. A lot of people who are coming into the course tend to think that uh, the mind or, mm -hmm. or the human brain is like a video camera. So uh, you can mm -hmm. rewind and replay uh, faithfully the information that you've accumulated, or uh, the information is somehow limited. So people can only store a certain amount of information mm -hmm. uh, before they uh, lose it to something else. Is that how the mind works? Uh, mm -hmm. or? Uh, what's a better conception of the way that memory works? No, that, that's a very good question. And I once taught a course where the structure was, you know, in all the critical ways that we differ from anything like a tape recorder. Mm -hmm. And it really is just a whole array of things. And, but, but people's general notion that they work something like a tra tape recorder mm -hmm. or any kind of recorder, uh, leads them to do very non-adaptive things. They take notes like a court stenographer mm -hmm. in a course, trying to remember something. And a, a court stenographer can get every word down all day long and not be able to tell you what the, what the court, whole trial was about. And then also some notion that uh, when I retrieve information, I leave it the way it was before. Mm -hmm you know, which would be true of a uh, compact disc or something. But whereas in the case of human memory, retrieval is a very dynamic process. It alters the state of the system. It makes what you retrieve more retrievable in the future. Mm -hmm. Things in competition with it less recallable. Mm -hmm. And so both on that kind of what memory researchers call the encoding side and on the retrieval side, we differ in just absolutely critical ways. Mm -hmm. And one of, one of the mysteries, one of the continuing interests in just how people learn and how they should learn is why wouldn't we, across our schooling years and stuff, just from the trials and errors of everyday living and learning, why wouldn't we learn how the thing works? Mm -hmm. And that really is a mystery, but one component of that, I think, is we may not understand the engineering details of like the uh, computer in a memory, uh, in a <laughs> memory in a computer, or the, uh, how a disk of some kind works. But we sort of understand the logic of it. And I think when we think, well, we probably work something like that. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and we don't work like that at all. It's a very different kind of architecture. Mm -hmm. So given what we do know about uh, now, I mean, you've had a long career of, of studying how people uh, remember yeah. and retrieve information. Um, what's the best way to uh, <clears throat> to try to maximize that? How do you? So again, mm -hmm. uh, some of the people who are watching this course want to know how to study better, how to how to retain yeah. information better, um, and it probably isn't very intuitive given what I know about yeah. your work. Uh, so what they think they know about memory and how to remember information probably isn't accurate. Uh, what is? Yeah, so it makes a lot of difference what activities you engage in trying to learn. And there are a couple key things to remember that then lead to important just things to have in your repertoire when you're trying to learn. Mm -hmm. One is we've already sort of mentioned that we don't work like a tape recorder. Uh, a key feature of storage in our memories is that that's a process of linking up any new information with what we already know. Mm -hmm. And in fact, rather than thinking of your memory as some sort of box or tape that the more you have in it or on it, the less room you have, actually memory storage creates capacity for additional storage. Mm -hmm. The more knowledge you have in some domain, the more ways there are to link things up and hook things up. It's almost like a scaffolding structure, mm -hmm. that the more it's built up, the more places there are to put things. And so it's always you want to make an effort to link this to your everyday experience, to what you already know, think of an example, try to extend it. All of those things really help at the stage of trying to encode the information. Mm -hmm. 
um, almost any way you can be active really helps. Mm -hmm. And a very broad principle is to test yourself, practice trying to generate the information. Do you know it? Get together with a friend, ask each other questions. Mm -hmm. When you just look at information in a text or on a screen, your judgment of whether you understand it, know it, could answer questions about it is very flawed. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you test yourself with a friend or by yourself, you get good information about whether you know it or not. Another benefit, of course, I mentioned earlier, is the very fact of retrieving it will make it more recalled in the future. Hmm. And then there's a third important thing. It potentiates the effectiveness of your subsequent study. If you've tested yourself, and I don't mean testing in such a formal way, you can just stop and think, can, could you summarize this? Mm -hmm. You're together with a friend, try to come up with a question an instructor might ask. Mm -hmm. Those things will then help you study better. They'll potentiate the effectiveness of study the next time you study. Mm -hmm. So that's absolutely important key, is to test yourself. I sometimes tell undergraduate students mm -hmm. that just an overall principle is that they should input less and output more. Spend less time highlighting, copying, and rereading, spending more time trying to come up with another example, trying to answer a possible question, mm -hmm. trying to reproduce the outline of this chapter. All these things try to sort of generate this material rather than trying to have it write itself on you. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole effort to just copy it down with the whole notion that it will sort of write itself on you if you're diligent enough is just so wrong and so wasteful mm -hmm. uh, that, that to spend that much time. Mm -hmm. uh, often students have come, they're disappointed in their exam. Uh, I ask them to bring their textbook, their notes, tell me how they're trying to study. And there's evidence of a massive effort, mm -hmm. huge amount of time spent on this. Yeah. Sometimes things are highlighted to the point the only thing that stands out is what's not highlighted. Mm -hmm. and, and, but, but that activity is not a productive activity. So you really have to learn. And then there's other principles like the very well-known spacing effect. If you're going to study something twice, mm -hmm. don't just read this chapter again right away to try to see what you missed. Go on to other material, other courses, and then come back to it. That's called the spacing effect. Mm -hmm. And those spacing your study opportunities can lead sometimes to a doubling mm -hmm. of your later recall. Yep. So how you manage yourself uh, really matters. Yep. And there's a whole series of things to learn about just managing your own study activities. Mm -hmm. And then some sense of how easily it is to get misled. Some of the poorest things that you can do from a learning standpoint uh, create an illusion mm -hmm. that you're learning rapidly. Yep. Uh, massing study sessions or practice makes people improve rapidly and then forget very rapidly. Mm -hmm. And so it's becoming sophisticated as a learner has a lot of components. You have to monitor the state of your learning well. You have to control it. Uh, a whole series of knowledge about sort of activities. Use technologies well. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than poorly, yeah. uh, so it matters. Now, despite the decades of research into this stuff, most high school and university classes uh, are done in a kind of traditional format. They call it the sage on stage, where uh, a professor stands in front of a room and their job is to profess, to, to fill these empty vessels, these students, with knowledge. But what's actually happening in a lot of these classrooms is students spend their time taking notes and they're feverishly uh, trying to record what the professor is saying, kind of like a court stenographer, right? And so that doesn't give much of an opportunity for students to really engage with the material, to process it uh, deeply. Instead, they're just note takers. That's, that's their main role, I think, as students. And I have a lot of experience with my students in each of my classes that I teach and I talk to them, each of them, about how they, how they record 
their lectures, how they take notes, how they study for these sorts of things. And the vast majority of people, when they sit in a class or they sit in a, in a university lecture, it's as you said, they just they write down absolutely everything that you say, and that's that's their method uh, of of studying. And that's it's very common. In fact, I suspect that a lot of the students in this course are probably writing down every word that we're saying right now. And that's not the most effective way of learning. We know this, but um, it's extremely common. So is highlighting the information when they're reading a textbook. And obviously, the, the, the title of this segment is Learn by Doing. And it, what we're really trying to emphasize here is the importance of active learning. Of, it's, it sounds trite. The, the active component, the struggle that people have with generating the content, and that is extremely important. It's not enough to just sit back and let the information kind of wash over you. It, it's a matter of actually producing the content, so that, that struggle, I think, really solidifies it in memory, really cements it, so you'll remember it far longer than you will if you actually just reread the information. Yeah, I think anything, what we mean by that active learning is anything you can do to, to engage with the content more deeply. Uh, so this can be anything from quizzing yourself, uh, using flashcards, uh, getting your friends to quiz you, just chatting about the content with your friends and family over dinner, uh, trying to to relate the concepts that you're learning now to other concepts that you know really well. Uh, just relating uh, the material to your everyday experience will really help with encoding that information. And this is something that uh, both John and Bob said, that uh, memory and our learning kind of works like a scaffolding. The more that you know, the more that you're, ca the more you're, the more you know, the more you're capable of knowing, right? And, and as we've heard, memory does not work like a video camera with some kind of limited capacity. It, it's, it's kind of better than that. You can build on this material uh, if, you, if you work on it actively. So that'll help with encoding and it'll help with retrieving those memories when you need it uh, in the immediate future or, or months down the track. That's exactly right. But I think what we need to do is make that idea of... Um retrieval a little bit more concrete. So what does that actually look like when people are retrieving the information? And I think the, the best way is something that most people are already familiar with, and that is flashcards. So obviously something as simple as learning another language. And so if you see the word, say, bonsoir in French, if you actually have to generate the English equivalent of that word from memory, that struggle, that oh, bonsoir, what is that? It's uh, it that that process right there that, that you're actually engaging in to, to to generate good evening in English. That's that process that we're after. But if you just see the words bonsoir equals good evening in a guidebook or in your textbook, you can read that a dozen times, and it's not going to get you any closer to to remembering that information nearly as much as actually generating that. And so having flashcards, writing on one side of the card, bonsoir, having generating the English equivalent, writing it out, and then looking on the other side whether you were correct or incorrect, going with another French phrase and, and so on, having English on one side and French on the other and going back and forth. But it's not just simple association learning like that. It can also be very complex. And so we can have a word like, um, or a concept like the availability heuristic. So on one side of the card, you have what is the availability heuristic, and you generate the response. So students in this class might actually try it. So you have on one side, availability heuristic, go, right? What is it? Generate the description of the availability heuristic and then once they've tried and they see where they're not quite clear as to exactly what their understanding of that is then they can flip it over and then they can see exactly what that definition is and you can do that for the same you know for the confirmation bias you can do it for representativeness heuristic for each of the topics and the content in this course put it into a flashcard use retrieval learning and see whether you can actually explain it or not, whether you can actually talk to your mother or, or your sister or something and explain that concept to them. And it's only when you see 
only when you struggle with that material in, in, in producing it that that real learning happens. And that is going to cement it in memory and you're going to remember it for, for much, much longer. I think now it's really important to realize that this process, this struggle of retrieving something from memory and making mistakes is by far the best way to learn. I mean, a good, a good sort of heuristic or rule of thumb that you can use is that if it feels easy, you're probably doing it wrong. I think that's right. And another really good example of this is uh, when you're preparing a talk or a presentation of some sort. Now, the first sort of knee-jerk response when you're preparing a talk is to, to memorize it, to, to write out the entire thing and read it, and then reread it. In preparing for this, for this big event, that's what am, most people do. How right? else am I gonna get through it? That's right, but in fact, that's probably the worst thing that you can do. The, the best advice that I can give when preparing to give these sorts of things is to give it, right? Just present it, find, pre present it to your dog or your cat or your friend or your mother or something. Anyone who's willing to listen, just have a go. Don't, don't worry about um, getting the lines right or, or getting, it's going to be bad. The first one, two, three times that you do is going to be horrible. You forget what it was that you were talking about. It's going to be terrible. But that's the process. If you're actually trying to generate the thing, if you're trying to struggle to remember the themes of your presentation, what it is that you're going to be talking about, that process, that struggle is going to cement it in memory, but it's going to make it a lot more flexible. When you're actually giving the talk, you won't be stuck to your lines. You're not going to, if you lose your place, you won't be, you know, out on a limb. You're going to be completely able to adapt and go on to something else, and it's going to seem a lot more natural, a lot uh, more pleasing to the audience to watch that sort of presentation than one where people just memorize the entire thing. So I think you're right. This idea of, of struggling is something that's not comfortable. It's probably the worst thing that we can possibly uh, imagine. But it's, it's also, it's, Bob Bjork calls this uh, desirable difficulties. And this is just one example. This is the difficult part, right? That struggle, that, that feel of, uh, that feeling of of, um, of uncomfortableness that comes with trying to generate, trying to retrieve that information. The desirable part is all of the the benefits that that kind of that that kind of provides. Six months down the road, or when you're giving your presentation, these desirable part is is really the reason that we're doing this entire episode uh, is for people to kind of reap the benefits of that. And so here's what Bob York had to say when I asked him about desirable difficulties. I think in the early 90s you coined the term uh, desirable difficulties. Now these um, are obviously not the sort of things that would occur to students yeah. who, who would immediately uh, think of them when studying for an exam or something. Mm -hmm. could, you, could you just explain desirable difficulties? Well, the, the notion of desirable difficulties, that, that refers to a set of manipulations that all have the property that they create challenges, a sense of difficulty during the acquisition process. That's the sense in which they're difficulties. Mm -hmm. They're desirable in the sense then they enhance long-term retention and transfer. So varying the conditions of learning or practice examples rather than keeping them constant and predictable, yep. um, reducing, using tests rather than presentations as learning, interleaving the separate things to be learned rather than blocking practice on each thing at a time. Uh, there's a whole set of these that, that create this misimpression uh, actually, I've just given you the desirable difficulties. <laughs> they create the sense of difficulty, yep. uh, but then are associated with better long-term retention. Mm -hmm. And really, it, another way to put all this is a very old distinction going back to the 1930s between performance and learning. Mm. So performance would be like uh, how accurate you are, how rapidly you can do something during the acquisition process. Mm -hmm. Learning is those changes in, in relatively permanent changes that will support your being able to recall, use this 
information later. That's what we would like to optimize. Mm. But what happens is we can confuse performance during the process mm -hmm. as evidence of learning. And many things that make performance go up very rapidly. Uh, mass practice, continuous feedback, keeping conditions constant and predictable, uh, make performance go up really rapidly mm -hmm. and then are associated with very poor long-term learning. Right. And other thing that's made these results so important is various things where you ask people what helped you learn better, this condition or that condition, or predict how well you do on the test that comes in a week. It shows that people are really fooled by their current performance. Yeah. It's, an, it's not only an unreliable indicator of whether learnings happen, it's sometimes exactly the opposite. That, so it's, we're really at risk of misinterpreting whether we've acquired the skills and knowledge that we are intending to acquire. So uh, it's, it's, on the one hand, it's never been more important to know how to learn mm -hmm. because more learnings happen outside of formal supervision. We're on our own, we're at a computer, we're doing this, we wanna in, learn some new technique for job purposes or whatever across the whole lifetime. So we need to know how to learn, but it's not easy. Our intuitions mislead us. A lot of the standard practices that we've been exposed to in schooling are not optimal. We, we would just natural for us to think, well, if our teachers did that, mm -hmm. that's the way we should do it. Yep. And that's often wrong. So um, it's really, it's a critical kind of juncture mm -hmm. of, of can people learn how to manage their, be, be effective stewards of their own learning. And that's an ultimate sort of survival skill. My name is Bob. I think about learning. That distinction between performance and learning uh, that Bob mentioned, I think is really important. I mean, we like to think we know how to learn, how we learn best, in what situations we learn best, and that we know when we've learnt something. But as we saw in episode three, uh, we have no real insight into, into, the, the, into the basis of our behaviour. and we, It's really difficult to predict uh, what we'll learn and whether we'll be able to retrieve this stuff in the future. I mean, that's, that's exactly right. But who better to provide uh, an indication of how much we learned than ourselves, right? And, and again, we, as you said, we saw this in episode three. We're not the best people to determine whether we understand something or not. And it's, we're, we keep coming back to this idea of fluency or ease of processing. System one is responding and system two is picking up on how easy it was for system one to do that. And that's exactly what's happening here with learning. If, if something is easy, if something goes down easily, we misinterpret that ease, that simplicity with knowledge, with comprehension, with understanding. And that's, that's a real problem. And it's, it's paradoxical in a sense because people use that information to gauge how much they know about a particular concept. And I have a, a really good example of this. Uh, it was back quite a few years ago. Uh, I was teaching uh, an advanced statistics course uh, for honors students, and it was compulsory. All the students were required to take this course, a fourth year honors level course called Advanced Multivariate Statistics. And the students were understandably very uh, worried, very anxious about taking this kind of difficult topic, and it was difficult. Uh, and I worked hard, I really worked hard to try to do everything I could to make it easier for the students to understand this material. But at the time I didn't really, I hadn't really read much in this area, uh, and so I didn't understand the importance of retrieval and the importance of uh, desirable difficulties. Um, so at the time I gave, I prepared this lecture, it was a very difficult lecture on eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And uh, I did everything I could to make it easier on the students. For example, 
um, I represented it in a whole bunch of different ways. So you have, you can represent this in matrix notation and algebraically, geometrically. Uh, I did, I had diagrams. I had, I was essentially pre-processing, digesting all of this stuff for the students. So all they had to do was just sit back and kind of watch it unfold. Now they did that. And I had one student who came up to me after the lecture and she said, Jason, you know, I, I completely understand. I get it. It feels so much better. Now that you've presented it to me, I understand everything about eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And I thought to myself, well, there's no way. There's no way that you could have. I struggled. <laughs> it took you weeks to, to put this stuff <laughs> to together. Prepare, exactly. Yeah. And, and preparing it, you have to sit down and work at it. Do a few problems and, and try to explain it to yourself. And she didn't do that. And sure enough, when the exam came around, she didn't do that well. She clearly didn't understand it as well, nearly as well as she thought that she did. Yeah, the same thing happens to me when I'm uh, watching a documentary on a topic that I don't know much about. So when I'm watching a beautiful BBC documentary by Brian Cox uh, on the wonders of the universe, right? So he's talking about a complex topic like entropy and he goes on and he's using these beautiful examples with, you know, sand and talking about time and how it relates to basic physics and how we perceive time. It just, it, it looks looks fantastic and I'm like wow I've never understood this so well I guarantee if if somebody paused that TV show and asked me one thing about entropy I would not be able to tell them at all that that I was fooled by uh, that that feeling of fluency it felt really good but I actually didn't understand the material as well as I thought that's really important to have these checks to have and that's exactly what um, this sort of retrieval does when you're actually forced to generate entropy. So if you pause the film and said, what is entropy? And forced you to say, well, it's, uh, yeah, I really have no idea exactly what it is, but it went down easily. Then, then I think we're getting closer. But there are a bunch of strategies that we can use, a bunch of these sort of desirable difficulties. Yes, they are hard, but uh, one is retrieval, retrieval practice. Another is spacing, putting it uh, time and time again. Another one that we didn't talk about is this idea of interleaving. And so what you can do if you're studying, uh, study statistics for a bit, follow by biology, do a bit of English, and uh, present these things in kind of an interleaved format. So you're not just studying uh, statistics in a five-hour block. You're kind of spreading it across, a bit. so you're kind of getting spacing in there as well, but it's this idea of interleaving, um, of doing one thing for a while and switching to another task. That is also a desirable difficulty. Um, there are a few others that you can do to, to, to make it just a little, restructuring your notes in a particular way, organizing it by theme instead of by uh, topic, which, and textbook, um, producers do this all of the time, right? They present it in exactly the, the most logical format. They highlight the important points for you. They're doing exactly what I did in my stats course. They're di pre-digesting all of this uh, information for the students so they don't have to, so they can just let it wash over them. And they mistake that fluency with understanding. And that's a real problem. So students in this course should probably be careful as well because, I mean, we're not professionals, but we've tried as hard as we can to make these videos look as good as they can. Uh, we've tried really hard to make the online experience as best as it can possibly be. Uh, but be careful not to be fooled by, uh, by, by that, that feeling of fluency. Instead, uh, pause the video, spend some time working, actively working, uh, uh, recalling this information and going through that struggle uh, to make sure that you really understand it and that you're really going to be able to retrieve this stuff accurately for months and years to come. Well, we've done a few things. In Think 101, we're not just uh producing this stuff for people to kind of um, absorb and then and wash and have them wash over it, exactly. Yeah. We're actually practicing what it is that we're preaching here. And so in the next segment, we're going to talk about exactly some of the things that we've done to take advantage of these desirable difficulties, to, to try to help the learners in Think 101 uh, retain the content for a much longer period of time. In Think 101, we're trying to essentially practice what we preach. So we just learned 
uh, a fair bit within this episode about learning to learn and uh, desirable difficulties and the best way to learn information and retain that information over a long period of time. So what do we do with this sort of information and how do we apply it in the course? Well, students, hopefully, they can kind of use this as, as an exercise to see, for example, how the spacing effect is imposed in our course or massed versus spaced learning or interleaving content or retrieval practice. Uh, some of the examples include for the spacing effect, we have it spread over 12 weeks instead of releasing all of the content all at once in 48 hours, for example. Uh, there's a quiz every single week instead of just a midterm and a final. So students are having to retrieve that information week by week. At the end of every episode, we have people provide an example from their everyday lives. And so if they can see, if they're actually working on the content, they're discussing this material um, around the dinner table or with friends, or they bring it up at the pub, the more that they do this, the more that they, that they retrieve this information and work on it outside of the course, the better it's going to stick in memory and the longer they'll have it. Um, there's a bunch of these examples. There's space learning, interleaving. Every single episode, people might notice, is shot in a different location. So we have uh, the lawnmower that starts in the background. We have lorikeets that are flying in the back. And so the idea here is that we have um, people don't just associate a particular concept with a particular location. So we have the availability heuristic, and they don't just associate that with Danny Kahneman's apartment. They learn it and they see it in a whole bunch of different contexts, and that's obviously important. There's a bunch of these sort of context effects that, that we're relying on throughout the course to try to make learning stick, to make these things stick in people's memory for a longer period. But the problem is we have to balance these things with interest. It's a difficult uh, sort of thing to do, as we said, because we have these desirable difficulties. We have um, these sort of effortful processes. It's hard. If we did this right, we would make this sort of material very difficult for students to kind of organize and everything else, but that's at a cost. We have tens of thousands of students in this course and we want to keep them around week to week. It's not like a university course where they have to be there in order to get certified. People are doing this on their own time. They're actually kind of sitting back and watching this almost as entertainment. And if that's the case, you can't make it really effortful for people in the same sense that we can in a university. So the way that we're trying to make it interesting is to have really high production value video, to shoot in interesting places. We're interviewing some of the best people on the planet. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we have the Mythbusters. That's going to be exciting. And this is hopefully going to keep people interested in the content. We have uh, coming up in the next episode, we have highlight reels and um, all of this is designed to keep people's interest, but at the same time we're trying to balance that with these sort of desirable difficulties to make uh, the material stick and last longer. So it's, it'd be an exercise for the students to kind of watch each of these episodes as we do them to see what sort of learning um, principles that we're applying and, uh, and see whether they can recognize what sort of things that we're doing. Mm -hmm.